thanks uh, everybody for having me, Eric and uh, Zach, especially for organizing uh, New York City Emacs or Emacs NYC. Um, my name's Bob Weiner. I'm a longtime software developer and a longtime uh, Lisper. Uh, so I'll explain some of the history of hyperbole in a little while, but uh, I'll be using the Emacs ePresent package tonight, uh, which is really just uh, converting org outlines into um, slides. But what I wanted to point out is that these are live hyperbole buttons uh, that do things uh, like show the hyperbole logo there or in this case run uh, the Tower of Hanoi. Um, and hyperbole doesn't know anything about ePresent and ePresent doesn't know anything about hyperbole. So that shows you just how globally hyperbole can uh, act. I just wanted you to know that. So let's get started. Uh, hyperbole, that's how you say it, not uh, how the British say it sometimes. And, uh, you know, I named it hyperbole because uh, I, I wanted it to do amazing things. And uh, I sort of knew in the back of my head, maybe we could have fun with that and that nobody would believe uh, some of the stuff that it would do or how easily you could work with it. So, uh, so that's where the name came from. Uh, so uh, the mission is really to uh, provide a productive uh, environment for all of your textual information uh, when you're working with it in, in Emacs, both uh, getting to the information through hyperlink and other capabilities and being able to program that and display it in efficient ways. Um, one of the big things is that hyperbole has these things called smart keys which, um, which uh, allow it to operate in all these different contexts. So as you'll see, uh, as you saw right there, I could just click a, click a button almost anywhere. So let the computer figure things out instead of uh, yourself. So along the way, you'll see these uh, quotes on the slides. I'm not gonna read those to you, but uh, they're all quotes from actual users and just saying in their own words why they like hyperbole. So it uh, started in 1991, which uh, tends to make people think that it's out of date, but if you're familiar with uh, Doug Engelbart's work, you know that uh, there's still things that he did in the 1950s and 1960s that we haven't gotten back to. He is the, the person, he and his lab invented uh, windowing, hypertext, uh, video conferencing, um, but they had a bigger uh, view of uh, uh, knowledge work. And uh, so he came out with this methodology for helping organizations to get more productive. And part of that was evolving your technology base. And the other part was uh, evolving your people base. And he felt that those should happen in parallel. So in 91, I had worked with uh, Doug for a while and I, I felt like there was going to be an information explosion. Um, so I wanted to uh, do some hypertext work and, um, and uh, you know, help people to manage this. One of the first problems I thought of was that people might get up to 5,000 email messages a day. So um, this was research work when I was in graduate school. And um, so uh, the first, um, tool that could be used by many different applications was actually hyperbole. It was built as a, a framework that would be used as part of this thing called personalized information environments. And um, the first application built on that was uh, a mail reader that was uh, fairly similar in some ways to uh, uh, Gmail, except that it worked in Emacs, as did hyperbole. So 1991, the web had not been invented yet. It came out, maybe started right then or uh, somewhere about a year from when we started the hyperbole work. So it was very opportune time. Everybody got reinterested in hypertext again. But uh, fast forward, uh, we stopped working with it for a while and then uh, a couple years back, uh, we brought it back and modernized it and integrated it with all the great things in Emacs today. Uh, and also made it a GNU project. 
So why should you use hyperbole? You probably use org mode. Everybody asks that question. Uh, one thing is you get very clean hyper buttons. Uh, I find org is great. It sort of hides a lot of the complexity, but when you look at the raw text, it's, uh, it's got way too much in it, too much noise uh, for somebody like me uh, and hopefully other people. So what you'll find in hyperbole is pretty much you, what you see in the text is stays there and uh, there's very little markup because all of the metadata is uh, stored in a separate file. And a lot of the hyperbole buttons actually don't have any metadata at all. Um, we'll get into the context sensitive uh, key bindings a lot. Um, the, uh, one of the things in hyperbole is this, uh, this uh, mini buffer menu that as you type a key, like I type D here, uh, then I get into the sub menu for doc and uh, it's very fast and you're basically just typing key bindings but it works very well to give you feedback on how to use the various parts of hyperbole uh, if you don't know already and uh, now recently in the last half a year we've done a lot of work to integrate it with org mode so uh, we're very excited about how you can uh, still use all your, your uh, core org capabilities, but also embed hyperbole, hyper buttons in there as well. So John uh, uh, Wigley, I don't know if he uh, still uses hyperbole, but he has used it in the past and he did some interesting things with it. Uh, and you'll see some quotes from him throughout this as well. So what the hell is hyperbole? Um, it's, uh, these were all the components basically. So a big part of it is two context sensitive keys we call the action and the assist key. The action is the primary one and the assist just uh, provides secondary help information most of the time. Um, we have uh, different types of buttons in hyperbole that we'll get into, but one that people really love <coughs> are implicit buttons. You basically just uh, like, uh, you you type a pattern like you surround uh, uh, a set of keys with uh, curly braces and all of a sudden that's a hyper button in your text no matter what the mode is and so it's very easy to create these live uh, interactive uh, tutorials if you want without really knowing much at all um, there are the other types of both implicit buttons and uh, explicit buttons uh, use action types so they're not limited to just being link buttons they can be they can execute arbitrary lisp uh, we'll see that along the way um, button files are just a convenient place easy to get to uh, sets of files that uh, you can put your buttons in so that you can start out there and move around very quickly I showed you the mini buffer menu already and then hyperbole has a couple different uh, subsystems in it that hopefully we'll see tonight. Uh, the K outliner is, uh, I think, uh, the most advanced uh, outliner of just text um, that's out there. It's uh, based very heavily on Engelbart's work. Uh, if you have seen that before, his system uh, NLS, which was later called Augment. And one of the things I wrote it because I couldn't find anything that would do what I wanted, like uh, just easy legal level uh, outlining and the ability to sort of move uh, trees around very, very easily. Um, high control is one of the newer subsystems. That's just very rapid uh, layout of your windows and frames. So uh, one of the things it does is uh, very rapidly change uh, your default uh, faces or all the faces you're using so they stay in sync, but you can grow or shrink those. Um, and high rollo is, is usually used as a contact manager, but it's really a generalized uh, record retrieval uh, system, records out of files. So you can have an arbitrary list of uh, files uh, with uh, hierarchical uh, entries in Emacs outline style. So it could be org files or just a regular Emacs outline and uh, free form records. And then like grep, except across a whole record, it, it retrieves them very rapidly. And you'll see that along the way. So it's very easy to get started with uh, hyperbole because it's an ALPA package, part of the GNU project. Um, so just follow that 
Uh, you should, I assume some people have it loaded already. You're welcome to install it right now. Uh, you're, you're one small version behind what I'm running tonight, so it's pretty much the same. Uh, shouldn't be any problem. And uh, you just press uh, Control H H to get that menu. Right away, Hyperbole tells you what version you're running. You should have 7.1.2 if you uh, get the Alpha archive right now. And um, so uh, all you have to do uh, to use it is, uh, and we're going to do a demo in a minute, is uh, use the action key bound to uh, made a return is its default binding. You can uh, bind it to whatever you like, though. Um, and then the assist key is on the same key, just with a, a prefix argument, or you could have a separate key for it. Uh, sorry. Uh, there are also uh, mouse keys, which are normally the shift button two and button three, but I use them so much that I put them on button two and button three. Uh, and there are the instructions. Uh, which you'll have available after this. I'll make the presentation available. Uh, so, you know, if I if I didn't have it loaded, I could click on this, and this is actually a hyperbole button as well, and it would uh, it would do what this is doing, and it put it on my second and third buttons. And in case you use like yank on your second button, and but you still want to use hyperbole buttons, you can toggle them on and off very easily with that command. So, all right. So let's let's uh, see how some of this stuff works. Uh, do something. Uh, so I wasn't saying that much there. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay. Sorry. So I, I forgot to say you're not expected to understand how I'm doing this stuff right now. That's what we're going to show you later. But I just wanted to kind of quickly show you some cool stuff that it can do. So basically. Uh, I can I can uh, split windows just vertically drag with mouse and I can horizontally drag with it and get a new window. I can then delete that window, uh, go back to just here. I can uh, I can cycle through uh, cycle through buffers. I don't know why. It's not... Yeah, right there. Um, I can uh, actually. Bring up uh, now. Normally, this would bring up Dured, but I've uh, enabled the setting to show you that we can integrate with other uh, external packages. This is Tremax, and just like I was doing in Dured before, I can drag it. Sorry, I can drag it and just display it anywhere I want. And of course, we can always just uh, change the size of our windows like that. So it gives you very good uh, with just the action key on the mouse very good control of your windows. You can also do stuff like, um, I can say, if I, uh, if I do this again, where I split this into, let's say, two by two, four windows. Uh, oh, I gotta get rid of uh, TreeMax, which I forget. Uh, let me just queue out of here. Okay, so if I, if I display, uh, this is a feature of hyperbole. I could display a three by three grid um, of, of windows right away. And then say I want to take um, this demo, uh, this demo um, file, and I want to throw it to this bottom right window, right? So I can say using another package that we've integrated called Ace Window, I just use Meta O. It shows me all the window names. Now this is the hyperbole integration. You type T to throw and then L and you see it went right to that window. So you can very rapidly place any set of information anywhere. If I go into Dured here, let's go back and just split our screen. Um, okay, and now if I want to, I can, I can do the same thing where from here I say made a O, the throw to S, and it throws the file that I was on. Uh, so, you know, I could do that with directories or whatever else. Uh, so very, very rapidly uh, move things around, uh, change the screen. You could be doing this with frames too. If you use uh, uh, Z for uh, your 
reference an ace window if I said Z instead of one of these letters, it would create a new frame. Let's just try that. Uh, uh, Z, uh, and you see it there. So I'll just get rid of that. Okay. So that's kind of a, a very quick thing, but what I didn't show you is uh, buttons. So let me just go to my personal button file, which I did with the menu right there. And I'll, I'll show you, uh, we're going to get into all this, but just uh, real quick that uh, there's things like path name buttons and the kit, they can include both elist var variables and uh, environment variables and they can even link to either sections in a markdown file or in this case this is just an emacs outline right no this is a markdown file so but it'd be the same so if it was an org file and you just uh, gave it the um, the section name it, it would jump right to it Notice also that I didn't have to use the markdown syntax of the dash here. I could just use the section name just as it was. Uh, here's a, a cool random one that like, uh, uh, I'll have to teach you about this, but basically this is, a, this is an implicit button, which I'll tell you about in a minute. And what that did is it just displayed that particular Emacs bug in uh, GNU's uh, so that anytime I refer to it in text, I can get right to the actual bug. Okay, so that, and that is about maybe six, eight lines of code uh, to do that, um, which we'll get into later. So back to the presentation. I hope that was a good little intro. Of, so now we'll get into how does all this stuff work. Uh, and again, if people have any like key questions, just ask along the way. So there's, there's three categories of buttons. Uh, implicit buttons are the ones that people use most often because you don't have to manually create them. You basically just type text, sometimes with delimiters, sometimes without, and um, hyperbole recognizes uh, the button based on the context in which it's placed. So the most common one, um, well, well, we'll see those when we, go into it in a minute. Explicit buttons are buttons that you do create uh, and you tell it, here's the action type I want you to run, here's the parameters that go with that, and you do all that interactively prompted in the mini buffer for it. Or you can even do a drag across windows to link between files. And we'll see that a little later. Global buttons are can be either implicit or explicit buttons. They're just buttons that are in your personal button file, uh, which uh, you just saw a minute ago was uh, a sample personal button file. And uh, you activate global buttons by name rather than clicking on them or pressing on them. So you basically have a completion list of all the buttons from your personal button file that you can get to regardless of what's on your screen very rapidly. Uh, every type of button can run an arbitrary action. So, uh, well, I mean, uh, all, all categories of buttons, I should say, can run arbitrary actions. Um, and so let's see what these things are like. Um, a little more detail. The button files, I think uh, there's two types of those. There's your personal button file, which is on this key. Uh, and there's the directory specific one, which is just one key different, personal and, and directory. So in every directory, you could have an HYPB file and that key will pull it up based on your current directory. So it just gives you, again, ways to navigate. Like uh, you could create a manifest file, right? Like you do in a directory and that could be your HYPB file. Um, so let's go over what uh, implicit buttons can do for you. So again, this is there's nothing to implicit buttons except what you see on your screen right here. There's no hidden data associated with them. They pretty much can uh, be embedded in any uh, type of file, right? In a programming file, you just put them within a comment. So um, we saw um, uh, a file link which can have a section uh, with the pound, uh, uh, an anchor referent, and it can also have uh, a relative line number. You just put a colon number after it. So, I mean, if I just click on that, okay. So I went to the second line of uh, in the demo, the hyperbole built-in demo, 
Uh, and I could have had another colon number here, and that would have gone to the character on that line. So similarly, we saw this one before. I went into the README file, a markdown. So any type of uh, file you can link to this way. Uh, what's neat is, uh, you know, if you have uh, variables like uh, load path or uh, path in Unix, you can put those in here. And uh, Hyperbole will recognize that it's a, a multi-directory variable, and it'll just find the, the first value that matches and actually take you to that actual uh, file. So in this case, Hyperbdir is just the uh, specific Hyperbole home directory where uh, all the code and you know the, uh, the distribution of Hyperbole. So what's neat is I could put this link in uh, a mail message, right? And then another Hyperbole user would get it who installed, installed Hyperbole somewhere else and the link would still work. So implicit buttons are useful both in your own information space and uh, as you move around and, and share with other people. And then Hyperbole also uh, recognizes ELISP uh, files especially. It knows that if I want to display that, this is not in the Hyperbole directory, right? Uh, it, it knows to look in load path. And uh, so I can just type the file without any path name. I could also uh, put a minus sign in front of this, and then it would actually execute uh, that um, that code every time I um, I clicked on it. So uh, so that's uh, path name uh, implicit buttons. I'm showing you a couple different uh, types of implicit buttons. There are many more. Uh, key series is very popular because it's essentially like keyboard macros, but you can just type them in in any uh, in any buffer. Let's try this one. Okay, so it went to the scratch buffer and it inserted all that text. Not not that exciting, but it just shows you that it's not limited to a single key binding. It can be arbitrary uh, sequences that we call key series. Um, uh, that you can embed anywhere. And what made this an implicit button? Just the braces around it, right there. Hyperbole looks and says, okay, it starts with uh, an actual binding. And uh, okay, I'll treat that as an implicit button. You notice that it flashed the button when I clicked on it. So it's like, it's almost like magic, but it's, it's real live hyper buttons all over the place. So you can do meta x commands. So let's do a couple things. This is going to demonstrate um, uh, dynamic creation. Instead of doing it interactively, I'm just going to click on here. But this is what we would do interactively. Oh, so I'm going to show you how hyperbole recognizes various messages as implicit buttons, too, essentially. So if I just do that. Um, I think uh, I think I got something else. Let me do it again. Okay, so it did the grep, and uh, I did it with a dash n. So now, uh, if th this can be in a text file or it can be in my shell buffer, if I click on that, uh, okay, let's just get the new one. Uh, it just loads it right up. Uh, so anywhere that you're doing greps or anything that has a line number with it, uh, it will. Uh, it will display it. So it's basically, I'm using one mouse button or I could hit made a return. Let's do made a return here. Uh, I think, I don't know. I, I think I'll just stick to this because org modes, uh, I am in org mode too. So, um, so here I want to uh, have an error and see the uh, stack trace. So here's some uh, Python that had, had a problem. So again, I can just click right there and it takes me right to the source of the problem. I don't have to be in a special mode or anything like that. Uh, oh, that's, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't have uh, Jedi running uh, right, uh, right here, but I'll just. Uh, and then uh, similarly with uh, Apropos, uh, uh, Unix Apropos, I don't know why it's, uh, making me do it the second time. But again, just apropos output, because uh, hyperbole has a, a type of uh, 
Unix apropos. I can click on that, and it displays the the uh, the page right there. And I can I can also follow these cross references with the same action key right here. Okay, so let me just go back to the talk. Uh, okay, so that was that was a core set of implicit buttons. Um, we've now generalized the concept of implicit buttons. Normally they look different, right? The, the key implicit buttons look different than path name implicit buttons. They have different delimiters. But we've generalized um, uh, to this concept uh, of action buttons. So you can take any Emacs uh, interactive, no, really any Emacs uh, command, any, any function, and any variable and or, or uh, a, a full uh, expression, uh, an S expression, but you change the outer parens to just these angle brackets, and then they become live. So if I click on that, it takes me to the shell. If I click on that, it says uh, fill column equals 70 because that's a variable. So it actually just showed, knew to show me uh, the value of the variable. Here, is a complex way of uh, showing the hyperbole demo, but hyperbole itself has a function that lets you use the variables in it. So I can just uh, click on that and it would display uh, the demo file again. So pretty cool, but there's a lot more. So here's all the built-in implicit button types. You can link to uh, info nodes, grep messages, the the debugs bugs that you saw, um, uh, identifiers in programming languages. You're using a single key to do all of this and to navigate all of this. Um, a cool thing uh, that I, I didn't highlight here, but uh, there's this notion of like social buttons. I can, I can do like uh, Twitter, uh, I forget, I haven't done this in a while, but I think it's like Twitter at, uh, I don't know, test. Uh, uh, you can do this, you can do Facebook, but you, what's more interesting for the technical people here is you can actually refer to GitHub uh, commits uh, for nine. So you basically just uh, set, a, um, set a project and uh, a user, and then you don't have to specify that in any of these links. And then this would take you right to the GitHub commit associated with that, or you could have an issue, uh, something like that. Um, and the, you just type them and they're live, so you can use them all over the place. Uh, any, any questions from that, people getting all of this? Okay, I'll just keep moving along. Uh, so a lot of power in there and you, you basically just load hyperbole and then all that power is at your fingertips. Explicit buttons are these ones that have this kind of delimiter around them and the hyperbole does highlight them like this for you so you can see all the ones that are in your buffer. And uh, I'm going to show you how you create those but uh, these are all the different types so you can see that there's a lot of different types of links that we can create, but there's also some that just run actions like execute a keyboard macro or evaluate some e-list. So we can actually in our buttons embed. And one of the things, why do we have the assist key? Well, let's see, if I press the assist key right now, uh, it does nothing because, let me try, see if this works. I, I can't guarantee it, but yeah, no, that's because it's org. Uh, so let me go over here to my height, but okay, so here's, uh, uh, do I have any? No, let's create one. Okay, so let's create an explicit button. So the first thing is, uh, you. the way I like to do it is to highlight some text first, which is going to be the name of our button. So let's call it new button. Uh, so I just highlight the region, and then I do control H H to bring up my menus. And then we're dealing with explicit buttons, so I type E. And then I want to create, so I type C. Uh, and then you get the button label right there because you highlighted it already. And then the action type, you can hit 
question mark. You have completions. So let's just let's just do a an easy one. Link to what? What do we want to link to? Uh, let's uh, let's link to an info node since we haven't seen that yet. Okay, and then let's just say hyperbole uh, smart keys. Let's see if that works. Okay. All right. So that was it. Um, so if I click on it, now it's live, and it took me to the smart keys. Now, what I wanted to say about the um, the uh, assist key is what I now press the assist key, the right mouse button, or control U made a return. Anywhere that you're curious, like uh, I probably might do something if I click here or press here, you can always see what it's going to do before you press on it, before you activate it. So let's say here. So this is an explicit button, so it does have metadata associated with it. And it's all here. It actually records when it was created, who created it, uh, what type it is. It's an explicit category. And then it links to InfoNode. And, and so, but here, there's no metadata here, right? So what's going to happen when I click the assist key here? Let's see. Nothing. Uh, let's try it here. Oh, uh, you know, this is not, it should be showing me something. Let me see. Yeah, okay. Uh, oh, it's in, yeah, there, there is a little, there is a little problem. Let me just resolve that, I think. And this is some new stuff that we've been playing around with. So uh, let me show that to you again if I, uh, so one of the ways that you can get the help up is since you have when you don't use the shifted keys if you use uh button two and button three you can depress the the first button like uh the help button and then depress the other uh smart key as we call them the action key so if i press uh assist and and then action it'll show me what the assist key will do in that context if i press action and then assist it'll show me what the action key will do in that. So I can just use those two mouse buttons to actually uh, see any context. And the reason for this is that I might also do a drag, right? So I might have a drag uh, thing like when I was splitting the windows. Let's try that uh, and see if I can actually do it here. Uh, okay. So there it showed me. Let me try it again. That's a little complicated. But you see, it does actually show you uh, a complex set of what the keys are doing. So it tells you exactly when it'll do it, what it calls, and what it's going to do. And I think if I, so one of the things, of course, uh, how the action key works in help buffers. So if you click at the end of a help buffer, it'll just get rid of it for you and take you back right where you were. So here again, action key works on all of info mode so basically what people do is they just kind of expect it to do the right thing and they try it out but if they don't know they can press the assist key and see what it's going to do so all throughout info all of these uh, can be navigated with our keys as well so uh, that's that's a pretty good summary of that i think let's go back to the demo uh where was a my oh uh, demos over here okay so that that was explicit button what i didn't show you is uh and we can do one more because i think it's important is that it looked like a lot of work to uh to uh create an explicit button uh is this where we were creating it yeah let's see i guess so yeah right down here so um let's uh Let's do that again, and uh, we'll, I'll show you to delete. If you want to delete a button, just do E, D. It says, do you want to confirm? Yes. Okay, now the button's gone. So let's create it again, but let's do it uh, where we use the drag capability. So let's, uh, let's go over here, and let's bring up, uh, yeah, say info again. Now let's bring up uh, the hyperbole demo, okay? Here's a hyperbole demo. Now, what do you think will happen 
if I, let me just click in here for a second. No, I'll do that later. Um, so new button, right? Highlight it, uh, drag with your action key depressed to the introduction. Okay, it says create a new button, yes. Okay, boom, the button exists. Now you notice all those steps I did before I didn't have to do. The reason is that when you drag to a context, hyperbole recognizes what's at that context and it just figures out what link type to create and then it creates it. So let's see if it did that. Okay. So it puts that, that section that I linked to right where I linked to it uh, as the first line in another window. So, um, you know, this is uh, if I, uh, one of the things that you can do in your text too is put a table of contents just like this in there. There's nothing else except what you see here. And then when I click the action key there, it takes me right to that section. No markup. That's what I was saying before. It's just all you have to do is this little table of contents thing, and then this becomes live in any, uh, you see it's not even in outline mode right here. Um, right here, we're embedding uh, key sequences. Those are live. We can activate them. Here's uh, path buttons. All of that's live all the time. So I think that kind of gives you an idea of some of the richness that's there, and you can explore. Uh, the demo that we're in right here is is quite extensive too. Uh, so you can just run that and spend like two hours, just like the Emacs tutorial, if you've ever done that. All right, so we have explicit and implicit buttons. So now <clears throat> implicit buttons, you normally can only click on them. You can't activate them because they don't have a name, but there's a way to give implicit buttons a name. Um, the the label that's attached to an explicit button is its name. So if we go back um, uh, to, uh, yeah, let's go back to our personal button file in here. Uh, so new button is what we would use to activate a global uh, button here. Let's, uh, we'll do that in a minute. And uh, if we have an implicit button, like uh, uh, let's say this one, Right here, this uh, let's uh, let's use one that's uh, just a, a simple path uh, uh, right here. Okay, so if I want to name that, uh, I can. Let's try it. Let's try the menus. I for implicit button. Uh, let's say uh, label. Uh, yeah. Okay. So let's move it inside. So label. This is a pretty new feature. I button label. Okay, the button label is going to be what do we want to call it? Uh, demo. Okay, yep. I didn't put it in the right place. I'll have to fix that. But you can <laughs> you can type it this way. So instead of the um, uh, uh, angle brackets with um, with um, parentheses, this uses angle brackets with uh, square brackets. So now if I click here, you'll see it should take me right there. Yeah, as it did, you just couldn't see it. Uh, so if I click on here, it takes me right to the implicit button. Normally it would flash that too. But, and when you have a label on an implicit button, you can separate it with uh, any number of colons, equals, or even dashes and it'll still work the same way. Let's try it. So it's very forgiving. And you see up here, uh, right here, also, uh, I mean, Hyperbole has a whole uh, set of capabilities where instead of having a separate package to display files externally, you just give it regular expressions that match your patterns, like your file type, like star.pdf, and say what viewer you wanna use. So I have that preset here. And what I wanted to show you is that the name of this implicit button can even span lines like that. And when I hit it, it brings me right into the previewer of the hyperbole manual. So hyperbole isn't limited to Emacs. It can basically be used to create tutorials that run arbitrary external programs as well. And then if you use Emacs client to communicate back to Emacs, 
you can be integrating hyperbole uh, with your other applications as well. So if we go back to our uh, demo here, uh, what this was going to show is that, uh, so let's, let's actually uh, get back to global buttons now. So by pressing the action key here, uh, uh, I pressed a different key, press the action key, uh, let's steal it. And uh, it, cr it created the about test global button. Uh, let me raise this up a little in case it's getting cut off right there. Okay, so this is just a series of keys that I did to create this button, which is going to link to the high about file. Now, if I wanna activate that by hand, instead of pressing this button right here, I'll just do it by hand. Control H, H, and then G for global button. And then I wanna activate that global button. Now I could type a tab and it would show me what my global button names are, but I wanna do about test. So I do that. And then it just takes me to the high about file, just like it should. Uh, so you can actually create uh, all sorts of buttons, or again, this could be in a, a tutorial, and it's all live. So I'll just get rid of that button now. And then when I try it again here, it says, wait, there's no match for about but test. I can't do that. There's no match. So I have to do another one. So all the buttons in our personal button file that were labeled, uh, we see here. Why don't I go to some IPython source code? Okay, that took me to a directory right there. Now, if I hit the action key right there, it displays it. You know, if, uh, if I had Jedi working right, then I could click on any of these things and normally do, and it would take me right to the module. Um, hyperbole automatically works with your tags files. So if you use e tags and uh, say create a tags file in a parent directory, but you're four levels down, your file's four levels down in the directory tree, it doesn't matter to hyperbole. You just click on the identifier, it walks up the tree, finds the appropriate tag file, uses that, uh, takes you right to where you wanna go. So the idea is that you get kind of a turnkey system that you can navigate all over the place and do interesting things with. But it's also highly programmable, just like Emacs itself. So. I, don't, I should have a, a fast key to get me back here, but I didn't program that. Okay, so that's global buttons, is buttons by name. Uh, let's see. So um, one other thing I wanted to mention before we got into uh, subsystems, and how are we doing on time, guys? We're at about a, a little bit over 40 minutes. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I figured if you guys are up for it, this could take an hour and a half, but <laughs> let's let's still keep it under an hour, but as best as possible if, if okay. we can. And then we'll, we'll I, I want I want to make sure that we leave room for everybody to ask questions. Sure. Uh, and and go from there. So, okay. all right. So I'll speed right. up a little, and I won't spend much time on here. Uh, the find menu under F is this idea that there's a lot of cool stuff in Emacs. There's a lot of good stuff on Unix, but it's hard to use like locate files or um, uh, removing lines. You know, there's like a keep lines um, function uh, command in Emacs. So what this does is just give you a very fast, easy to use uh, set of uh, features that sort of exposes a lot of uh, your common commands that you might use and, and does a few things like the grep is actually a recursive grep. So you just point it somewhere and it'll go there. There's also uh, web searching. So like on uh, Google, uh, uh, let's say we want to do like an e-list search. Let's uh, let's try it for info. I don't know. Uh, uh, okay. Okay. So uh, it just did a search, but it's a uh, file type. Yeah. Dot dot el. That's what. It, that's what that was doing. So this is gonna search for uh, only Emacs list uh, files when you do that Google search. So again, it's just fine and then W for web and you have all these at your fingertips. If you wanna search for an RFC, just type in the number and it's right there. Um, so let's keep going. This is a very interesting part of hyperbole, so let's demo it. But uh, 
I think if I just show it to you interactively, uh, and there's a built-in demo of the K outliner as well. So this is a special mode, just like org, um, that has its own format and embeds all the metadata for the outline in the uh, in the outline itself. But there's an if you type E on the K outline menu, there's an example uh, built right in that is an actual live outline that explains how to use the outliner. Uh, so let me just show you some of the cool things it can do. So notice uh, we label sublevels 2A and then it would be 2A1 and so forth. Well, let me create that one. I can create a whole bunch of secondary nodes and type them in. And now watch what happens when I, uh, when I move uh, 2 uh, below 1. I'm just going to hit tab to do that. And boom, all the numbers, or if I hit shift tab, uh, or uh, control U tab, uh, it'll bring it right back out. So uh, all the numbers all the way down are live all the time. And what if I what if I said I, I want to see this as um, as uh, legal number? Boom! I just changed the view, and now everything is legal numbered um, because lawyers just won't go away. Uh, so it's a real outliner, just like Emacs outlining. You can hide and uh, show things. But it also, uh, it also has this notion of view specs that you can put. Uh, when I hit Control-C, Control-V, that lets me change the view specs. And these come from the Engelbart work. So B is blank lines, E is ellipses, N is the numbering format. So if I change it back, I, A would change it back to that alphanumeric labeling you saw. But each of these cells, as we call each paragraph here, is uh, has a permanent hyperlink associated with it. So I'm going to turn those on so you can see them. Now, every cell, uh, you're seeing the permanent ID of that cell. So if I create a new one, it's 82, then 83. So they're in order, but you know, I might have moved things around here, so they're not always going to be in order. Um, so this is how you can know what those permanent hyperlinks are. But basically, hyperbole just uses them behind the scenes when you make links. And I'll show you. So say we want to uh, make a link to uh, cell number six. Uh, let's flip back first, uh, and I'll show you this. So let's go back to alpha labels, right? So, okay, so now I want to create a link right here to uh, here, and let's uh, do it. Okay, so I just inserted a link. By clicking the action key three times, uh, I did nothing else. I didn't use any other key. So what this does is this is an internal link uh, format inside K Outliner with the less than at sign, and it's linking to the 2B1 uh, that I clicked on the left right here. Uh, and this is where those permanent IDs come in. It, it automatically stuck the permanent ID in there. So let's say now I move uh, 2B, I, I shift uh, tab. Uh, so I, that became 2C. So it moved way, way far in the outline. Now, what's going to happen when I try to, it should go to 2C, right? When I use that link. And did it? Did it not work? I haven't done this in a while. To, yeah, it went right to 2C. So notice what happened. Also, it updated the link over here when I hit that. So it's, it's sophisticated, um, but easy to use. And you can embed these things if we look for in uh, implicit buttons that exist here. So you can actually put the view specs in a button right here. So here I can say not just uh, I can I can have a file link uh, to another K outline. In this case, it's this outline. Then I can say what cell I want to link to, and then after this pipe character, I can put the view specs in there to say show me uh, clipping to just one line in the outline per cell. So let's try it. Boom! You totally change the view of your outline. You got rid of blank lines. You cut it to just one. Let's cut it to just two lines and see if that works. Okay, now every cell that has two lines 
is uh, just like that. And if I want to uh, just put it back, I'll put the blank lines back. I'll get rid of the cut. I'll just put that back and we're back the way we were. So very powerful, very quick, uh, but all you have to do is type text and hyperbole does the rest for you. So I think that's uh, what I use it for is when I'm doing requirements documents or anything else that I want numbered, I just start numbering things like this. And then if I need subsections, you just do control J for a new cell or control U, control J uh, to get a sub level cell. And it has all sorts of capability that's really great. And then you just save it and it's just a file. Um, okay, that was that was uh, the K outliner. Hi Rolo is just a fabulous Rolodex. And so if I say uh, Linux, this is my personal Rolodex, so I, I don't want too much stuff on up here, but yeah, this sort of, so I can you hit T to collapse all the entries that I match to. I can tab through, well, this is, uh, org is rebound. It's, uh, let me go to the actual demo thing and do it again. Uh, this should work, tab, tab. So it just tabs through all the hits that I got. T shows me every entry very high up. Uh, one line per entry. And this is just an outline again. I can expand it. I can I can click on, uh, if I have, uh, let me see, let me expand it all again, show everything. Uh, okay, here I have an email address. Uh, let's try, any anything is live in here. If I put an email address uh, here, let's try that, okay hyperbole recognizes that as an implicit link so it puts me right into email composing i could have an auto dialer attached to this phone number right here and so forth so and then i just hit q and i'm out of there i'm back where i was i'm doing whatever i want so that could have been a whole library of records that i went through and the way you access it you can do control x 4 r a global binding or sorry it's just control h h r for rollo and then all the commands are right there. Simple. And notice uh, the I command, info. Most of the menus have an info thing, and it takes you right to the section uh, associated with it. So it's very well documented as well. All right. Uh, so we're almost done. Let's just roll through. Yeah, I, I, high control. I showed you some of that, the Windows grid before. Um, but just to show you real fast that. This is on the screen, the S command, and then you can control either uh, individual windows or frames. Let's try window control right now. And then I can say, let's split my window. Let's split it that way. Let's shorten the window. Let's heighten it. Let's widen it. Let's shorten it. But I can use a prefix argument. Um, I can set the prefix argument by typing numbers. So if I say, let's go by 10, uh, now, uh, I think, uh, oh, I hit 20. So if I say height now, it gets very big or shortened. It goes by uh, 20 lines. Um, if I hit a period, it resets the, uh, the prefix argument to nothing. So now when I heighten and shorten, it should go, uh, it, it should, uh, I gotta get back in there. Uh, so you've got all sorts of control here. You can delete your windows, you know, and just go back to one. Uh, and then just uh, capital Q to make sure you go out because you might be in a help buffer. You can usually use lowercase Q as well. And you're right back where you started. So that's high control. Uh, you can integrate with Tremax as we showed you, Ace Window, Org Mode. We've seen that all along. And uh, I don't need to talk to you about org mode, but we're still working on just making this perfect, but uh, send us your comments of what works, what doesn't work in org mode, and we'll make it work uh, smoothly like all the rest. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Matt, who's uh, my co-maintainer from Sweden. Uh, John Wigley's uh, written an interesting article on hyperbole that's just about 10 paragraphs. You saw some of it, you'll see some right at the end here. Uh, Adrian, uh, a bunch of you know, he has a short blog posting uh, 
and to thank the FSF and GNU for having us as part of their work. Uh, at the end of the presentation, there'll be these uh, these resources that you can uh, you can just uh, click on uh, to uh, learn about hyperbole and built in. We've also uh, uh, added a use cases uh, why hyperbole uh, that you can see right here. So um, that's built into hyperbole. And finally, here's the final perspective on hyperbole. It reduces your cognitive burden, as John says. You know, it it uh, lets you create these text recognizers that exist all over your information space, and you can add them all the time. Uh, maybe another time I'll show you how to define an implicit button type. But uh, just so you know, it's in this one file, HIB types. And if I use outlining to kind of collapse that, here's the path name implicit button that we saw. All, uh, you know, it's a little big right here. But basically, it's just handling a lot of different complexity. Like if you want to click on a file URL, kind of thing, if it's doing something special with gzip uh, things. But basically, it's just uh, it's just uh, another action type uh, like we're showing here. So this is a fairly complex one. But if we go down, uh, you know, let's say, let's say like the RFC. Uh, where's the RFC? Uh, yeah, right here. And we're almost finished. Uh, so that's... Uh, this thing actually uh, retrieves RFCs when you just type RFC-800. Um, so usually they're about um, four to 20 lines. And you create that once, and that is the type. You do it just like a define, except you say def IB. And then you've got a new implicit button type that you can use all throughout Emacs. So it's very cool, pretty easy to do if you're a programmer. Uh, the second uh, benefit of hyperbole is the network effects. As you build all these uh, capabilities together, just like Emacs, uh, you get a very powerful environment that lets you focus on your core knowledge work and not on the mechanics of putting uh, things together. And finally, uh, because it's globally accessible, you can do this with org, you can do it with info, whatever you like, hyperbole kind of flexes to that. That's it. Q&A time. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Bob. Uh, we'll open it up to any questions that anybody has. I think that what probably will be easiest is if people type in um, any questions they might have into here, uh, and then we can answer those questions as well. We have one from uh, Trevoke. I know that he has left, but he asked the question of um, does hyperbole also work with GNU, with, uh, GNU Global or C tags, or does it only work with E tags? Uh, good question. Um, it's, it's certainly, yeah, it certainly can work. Is it, is it built in? You'd have to, there's, uh, uh, there's like two functions that you, you'd probably have to just call the C tags uh, function. I think it's, it's customizable too. But it's very little code that you'd have to change out or or set a parameter uh, to do. Uh, so we'd have to look into that. But it's certainly fairly straightforward to do. Um, you know, and in fact, actually, it uses xref, right? So if your if your tags are uh, uh, abstracted by xref, then that should be automatic. So I would just try it. Okay, uh, and then second, um, How do I get that Trevoke too? also wanted to uh, know your uh, thoughts on org roam versus hyperbole. Yeah, so there's org roam and org rifle um, that we want to get into. I always say, and there's there's an Emacs wiki on uh, org versus uh, hyperbole that you can look for, but. I always say they're complementary. Of course, uh, org has outlining, but not the kind of outlining you saw today. Um, of course, org has hypertext, but org's kind of focused on your, you know, your calendaring, 
your agendas, your to-dos, and hyperbole really doesn't have anything to say about that. So I would recommend that you use both, and you know you might have a little bit of an issue with the key here or there initially because we are developing that integration right now. But the more org users that start with it and feedback to us, uh, we're pretty good. Uh, if you look at the GitHub uh, uh, distribution of hyperbole, there's very few issues there, or the same. I actually saw that there's some at uh, the GNU Savannah issue uh, tracker, but uh, I don't think they're, they're active issues. Uh, there is possibly a joke question of, is your system a modern realization of the mother of all demos? Yes, so that's what, I, I didn't uh, have a link to that, but uh, if we, you're still seeing my screen, right? Still seeing your screen. This is when, uh, in 1968, uh, uh, Engelbart had developed enough technology that he thought he'd share it with the world. Uh, this was a world that uh, had mainframe, a uh, few mainframe computers. They didn't need using paper tape. Nobody had a computer. And so he uh, got uh, video conferencing and showed something like the K Outliner uh, live uh, with people in 70 miles apart from each other uh, across computer screens. Um, and so they call it the mother of all demos. It's, uh, it's like 45 minutes, really why, worth watching. Just type that in and it'll come right up. Definitely should check that out. Uh, uh, it's uh, Engelbart right there. Yeah. The great, um, the next question that we have from Andrew is, uh, uh, he asks, can you explain the, okay, sorry. He doesn't seem to understand the uh, why this package also has a window management features. Uh, yes. Can you explain the relationship with uh, to hyperbole and or if you have any thoughts on splitting this up from yes. hyperbole? Yes, so that's a similar question that gets asked a lot of the time. So I, I, I tried to address it a little at the beginning where I said, you know, I, I didn't show you all the features, but um, let me see. If I go back to my other one, hyperbole wants to help you control uh, what's on your screen, right? So if I use the action key at the end of the line, it actually puts that at the top of my window. So that's called proportional scrolling. So uh, if I shift, uh, it might put it at the bottom. So the same way with uh, drags that control the windows, I want to be able to control what I'm seeing very fluidly with the same uh, set of concepts and keys that that I've learned already without having to remember too much. So the window management, frame management is so not, you can't just navigate somewhere, but you can actually control the way that information at the referent appears on your screen. So that's why we've integrated it all. And as you saw, I, I don't have to interactively use uh, high control. I can just embed it in an implicit button. And then I, I'm basically creating automations that usually people invent different languages for and you know write all these complex programs like Puppet and stuff. And mm -hmm. here you could automate things you know, by, by just stringing together uh, commands that you know already. Sure. I guess the, to the the follow up to that though, and this is coming from me. The is do you think that it is possible that somebody would want say that aspect of it, but may not necessarily want some yeah. of the other aspects to hyperbole? And would you yeah. be interested in splitting those up, just but making them very clearly uh, work well together? Just like hyperbole yeah. works very well I with org mode or Ace Window. Yeah. Yes, the reason we don't as a, is uh, one that we want hyperbole core, let's call, let's call like the hyper buttons the core of hyperbole, that you need to require that most likely anyway. So you're gonna end up loading it up. But um, if we split them out, we'd have to create separate manuals, we'd have to maintain them separately. It's a lot more overhead for us doing this as a, a very, very part-time basis. And you see there's a lot of capability in here. Um, so we don't wanna increase our workload 
And because you can install it and uninstall it, it's one package, it stays out of your way. If you don't uh, hit the screen, that, that S, the, this doesn't affect you. So just like Emacs has doctor in it uh, as a module and you never use it, or may, some people may not use it, uh, it, it doesn't affect you. It just takes up a little space on your hard drive. But it's not getting in your way. None of these subsystems, the high rollo, uh, uh, K outliner, and high control do anything unless you ask them to. Makes sense. Thank you. Uh, this one uh, from Grant, it's, it's a little bit long, but it's a really good question. Uh, he asked, Bob, assuming you have, you, that you took everything that you learned in the last 28 years about philosophy and psychology of information management, but you forgot the technology. As an experienced as an experienced software developer, uh, Is this the ring? how would you start approaching the problem space today? Tech tools, people's teams, operating systems, networks, database, anything. Oh, and well, as it pointed out, it is a little bit off topic, but okay. still an interesting question. Well, that's kind of interesting because so after I got done with my research uh, uh, for my master's where Hyperly started, I, I went back and people wanted to know what I had been doing. I, I worked at Motorola, so I gave a presentation, you know, sort of like I thought I'd explain big picture, just like uh, Engelbart. So I had this notion which turned out to be uh, iPads uh, of, you know, how can you like rapidly with just pointing and tapping uh, navigate through very complex hyperspaces. So uh, hyperbole gives you a little view of that, but you know, it's really text focused. And I sort of uh, had this vision of uh, multi multimedia. And of course, you know, implicit buttons can bring up arbitrary media types. Um, so I, I sort of see, and there was a graphical representation as well that very quickly showed you, you know, sort of like mind maps, I guess, um, but let you uh, move around in a very vast hyperspace much more easily. So I think that's something that I would uh, want to have around. Very cool. Um, looking for anybody with any more questions. We'll take one more question uh, and then we will call it. Uh, the last question that we get is, is it easy to export to LaTeX? <laughs> no. So, uh, uh, but uh, the, the K outliner can be exported to Emacs star outlines or, and thus become org, I guess, um, uh, to, or to HTML. Uh, so you can make web pages out of it. Uh, it's not that hard to make another exporter because there's, uh, you know, all of hyperbole is abstracted pretty well. So there's a map across cell um, uh, function that you can run arbitrary code on. So you just basically walk through the trees and do whatever you want to them. Um, so uh, remember I said, I don't want all this markup and I want to see what I'm getting. So there isn't a lot of hidden stuff in the hyperbole. So this outline is what it is, you know, pretty much just raw text. And org is the way to go if you want to embed all this sort of stuff, you know, tables and uh, much more um, structured um, kinds of outlines. So again, you know, you could use certain hyperbole features in an org outline. And then you could, uh, what do they call it? The Babel uh, translator thing. Um, you can weave them all together. And so I think it'd be better to use hyperbole hyperlinking within org for that kind of thing than to try to get hyperbole by itself to do that. Very cool. Um, that's it. Um, Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you very much, Bob, for this wonderful presentation on hyperbole. Uh, this was fantastic. I just wanted to say, tell your friends about it and try to encourage people to use it because it's not a very widely used package. And we, especially org users, we, mm -hmm. we welcome everyone. And uh, we're, we're here to uh, help you. Great. Uh, thank you again. And just a reminder for everybody, this has been recorded. So we are going to be releasing this on uh, both emacsnyc.org 
and we will be uh, putting this also on YouTube as well. So uh, you will be able to see it there. Thanks again for everybody for coming. Thank you very much, Bob, for this presentation again. Uh, and we will are figuring out what is going to be happening next month, but we will be meeting the Monday after uh, after uh, Labor Day next month, which should be is going to be September fourteenth, very late. Um, so we will talk to everybody then. Thank you very much again, uh, and see you later. Thank you, guys. Bye.